Good morning, everybody. My name is Pete Boel, and I'm one of the pastors here, and it is great to see all of you this morning, especially if you're new with us. Some of you may have come to the Altria uh, at Easter for your first time with us, so if you're here with us this morning, um, pray you might just find somebody that uh, you can have a conversation with. You can connect out at the connect table. Um, every time they've sung that song this morning, I've been moved in different ways, and it reminded me last service that often um, I will say almost things like I'm undone and I think um, when we're saying that we are so preoccupied by our problems that we worship them they become the focus they become the center so my pray a prayer this morning is that um, <clears throat> we can let some things go that you've come in here with, that we can be undone by a mighty God. And in our worship of him, even though it doesn't seem to make sense, it just those other things kind of fade when we see the bigness of our God. And I also believe that you don't go anywhere by accident. There's someone here this morning that may particularly need to hear something from this message and pray that God will speak to your heart in that way. So let's prepare all of our hearts together and let me just pray again. <clears throat> and now our Father, come and fill this place by your spirit. Meet those who are needy. Meet those, Lord, who are on this road to faith. Those of us that are discouraged in faith. We pray, Lord, that we would not just leave here inspired, but we would leave standing more firmly upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, our Savior and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name. I have a friend who likes to say, it's a good life. But sometimes when he says it, I get cynical. My wife will tell you there are some mornings I wake up and greet the day with a groan. Because <sighs> you know the meetings you have that day, and you're not sure you want to go to them. You know the homework you didn't finish. Or the stuff you kind of gave a half-hearted effort on. You're like, oh, this is not going to be received very well. You know your car needs to be repaired or is that crack in the windshield and, oh, i got to time it with money and time to get it in because i got to have another car to drive to work. So you groan because life can feel like a grind sometimes. So a couple of weeks ago, I was pulled over on Patterson Avenue. <coughs> I mean, everybody was speeding. I just kept pace with the traffic. <laughs> and so uh, the officer pulled me over and said, is there any emergency that I need to be aware of? <laughs> I think it's a new question they're asking. And so I thought, okay, it's time for me to pull out the pastor card. So I said, well, I work up at the church right up the road here. I don't make a lot of money, but hey, anything, you know, big deal. And I didn't say the money part. I didn't say that. But I did say I'm, I'm headed to the hospital. I was going down to VCU to visit a, a sick child. And my daughter was getting married that weekend. And that's when I did say, and, and I don't have a lot of money, and I'm a little stressed out and overwhelmed right now. And my wife, who was sitting right there next to me in the passenger seat, and I said, that's my wife. And she's given me a big list to do, and I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> so he kind of smiled and said, well, I just, let me just check your license. And I'm like, oh, he's going to let me off. He's just going to check my license. He's going to bring it back. So he brought it back with a big ticket. <laughs> so I looked at him, and I said, officer? You're not getting invited to my daughter's wedding this weekend. <laughs> he didn't really think that was funny. Life can be a grind. Here's some of the things I groan about. The James River. 
it's way too high over the last year. Lots of rain, and it's kind of muddy, and you can't get any boating in. It's not that fun. <clears throat> My lawn tractor is too slow compared to the guy next door with a zero turn that just weighs merely. <laughs> takes him an hour, takes me three hours. When can I stop moving my kids out of second floor apartments? <laughs> I'm going to Radford in a couple of weekends and sure enough, I'm moving my youngest son out of his second floor apartment and my knees aren't as great anymore. I think instead of getting rent to help or friends help, they like to get parent help. That's what my kids do. Oh, or why are my Red Sox so bad this year? That's frustrating. What's your list? I mean, there are some times when we just get up and like, oh. so let's try to put us out our groans this morning. Let's get present and let's look at God's word and see what Jesus says about abundant life through his word. Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they might have life and life to the full. But how do we find life on Monday after the inspirations of Sunday? How do we find life when life seems like such a grind? We may do it for a half a day or a couple of days, but there's always these speed bumps. But how do we find life in the midst of it? So I'm going to read to you a passage from Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. It is such an appropriate passage after Easter. Paul wrote this to a church at Ephesus to tell them to have hope in the resurre res resurrection. And this is what he says, starting with verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins... He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. We living in the heavenly realms, church? So God can point to us in all the future ages as examples of the incredible wealth, I love that word, wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit from it. Some of our version says, it's by grace you have been saved and not by your works. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I think focusing on the good life or trying to find this abundant life is not going to find it. I think we have to understand grace to find abundant life. Now, it feels a little warm in here. And, you know, when you're a preacher, you can sense it. It feels like, you know, people are a little preoccupied. But this is so important. We either need to be reminded of the grace that God has given us or to know for the first time about God's grace. Said another way, working hard to find the good life will not find the good life Jesus is talking about. The Christian life, the abundant life, is fueled by grace. If I had a kind of a servant team around here, I was looking actually earlier this week for maybe a gas station pump that had been taken away and just put it right up here and say the Christian life is fueled by grace. Every time you stop and fuel your car, remind yourself that my life is fueled by grace. This is where I am going to find the abundant life. So I want to read a passage from a favorite book of mine. It's by Henry Now, and it's called Out of Solitude. I give it to people that are new in faith. I give it to summer interns. I reread it about every other year. It's a short book. If you're not a big reader, it's a short book with big words and there's even pictures. <laughs> but it's very profound. Listen to what Nowen says. 
When we start being too impressed by the results of our work, we slowly come to the erroneous conviction that life is one large scoreboard where someone is listing the points to measure our worth. And before we are fully aware of it, we have sold our soul to the many grade givers. We are intelligent because someone gives us a high grade. We are helpful because someone says, thank you. We are likable because someone likes us. And we are important because somebody thinks we're indispensable. In short, we are worthwhile because we have successes. And the more we allow our accomplishments, the result of our actions to become the criteria of our self-esteem, the more we're going to walk on our mental and spiritual toes, never being sure if we will be able to live up to the expectations we, which we have created by our last successes. Standing on our mental and spiritual toll, because I, I don't know if I can do that again. Do you get that? You have a good presentation at work, and you're thinking, I got another one next week. I hope it goes as well. But if it doesn't, ooh, I'm going to feel the tension. I'm writing a sermon. I hope it's as effective as last sermon. I, I want to be seen as doing a good job. Oh, man, I, I keep my grades pretty high, but, uh, you know, I'm starting to slump here. And for some reason, it works on our self-esteem. And then he goes on to say, in many people's lives, there's nearly a diabolic chain in which their anxieties grow according to their successes. This dark power has driven many of the greatest artists into self-destruction. That's a powerful line to me because it resonates with me. Not because I'm a great artist, because there's so much anxiousness in my life of not measuring up. This dark power dark power has driven many of the greatest artists into self-destruction does anybody resonate with that anybody raise your hand if you resonate a little bit with that okay who who hasn't read the book i got an extra one (laughs) anybody want this book it's a great one oh right here there you go guys thank you that's the love family really that's tommy love and his wife so Okay, where'd my book go? So, I'm going to reread something we just read from the Word of God, and I want to let God's Word speak for itself, okay? So, if this is a living thing, Lord, would you speak to us? Listen to what it says again in verses 4 and 5. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Church, we live in a culture of the self-made man and woman We like to watch the entrepreneurs on Shark Tank. We like to find the best way, the fastest way, the cheapest way, the Amazon Prime way. But that's not how grace works. Do you understand it? We've been so immersed in our culture that we transfer some of this work oriented success oriented life into our christian faith and think this is the way this must work too but what did paul say in this passage paul says we're spiritually dead because of our sins this means we're not struggling to keep our heads above the water of sin we have drowned There is nothing we can do on our own strength related to that. We are helpless against it. We are spiritually lifeless and unmoving. That's what this passage says. And as hardworking Americans, we don't like that. We were born to run. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to be excellent. That's going to be my focus. And I'm going to do that for God too. 
and measuring up in that way leaves you exhausted and with low heartedness. The Bible says dead means dead. If heaven is Hawaii, none of us can get there with the backstroke. We're going down. We can't make it. But the Bible says that God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were spiritually dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. So you will really understand, we will really understand Easter life when we understand that we have been raised with Christ from the dead. That's when the resurrection will really become real to you. That God raised you to life because you're united with Christ without any effort on your part. Now, there's a tension even in preaching this, there's a tension in a room like this because people are like, okay, yeah, but, but you got to serve. you gotta, you got to do something for God. I get it. But the Bible says we focus on the grace of God and what Christ did in us and in our response of such gratefulness that when we come to God and like, I failed again, and he says, that's okay, I love you unconditionally. That gives you strength to get up. Because you're so exhausted of doing the work of spirituality. And you say, I want to respond to you, God. And I even want to give grace to this person because of the way you've given grace to me. Amazon Prime can deliver our groceries to feed us. But it cannot make a new life. And more personally... We can work hard in life, and there's nothing wrong with that, to make money or to find more success. But we do not have the power to make a new creation. A creation that will last beyond this life for eternity. Only the power of God can do that. And this is called the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace means only the mercy of God and the love of God can make living people out of dead people. Some of you may remember the story of my son Jonathan. I like to tell it because it's, it's been such an indelible mark on my life. When my oldest son was a teenager, he went through a tough time, and he was far from God and far from us. It broke our hearts, and I believe it broke God's heart. Until one night when he was right around 21, he called us from college and said how sorry he was. And so later I asked him, in fact, on this very stage when preaching a sermon on the prodigal son, I said, Jonathan, what was it that changed you? Was it the message that night that you attended from Campus Crusade where all of a sudden you realized, ooh, I'm going the wrong way? Was it regret? Was it reading the Bible and it came alive to you? No, no, Dad. Jonathan, what was it? Grace. Okay. What does that mean? And he said, Dad, Grace has a name. And his name is Jesus. And all I know is he met me. And gave me his unconditional love again. Grace looks down upon a cross. And Grace for us looks to the cross. And sees from his head and his hands and his feet blood and love mingle down to us. Grace meets us in our weakness and lets us look upon the face of our Heavenly Father who does not condemn us, but opens his arms and says, come home, come home. Life is not one big scoreboard where somebody gets to measure your worth. 
we are already, listen, we are already of great worth to our God. And this is incredibly freeing. This is the grace-filled life. A friend of mine came into town yesterday for a job interview. It was going to be a long one, and he was nervous about it. It was a five-hour interview with different executives in, on the team. And he was nervous about it, so I texted him, and I said this. Hey, enjoy the process. The Lord has something for you in it. So he texted back, and he said, I will try to remind myself of this. Now, I was reflecting on this sermon about grace, and I'm like, try to remind yourself about this? I was getting a little fired up. I thought, what do you mean? That sounded like a lot of internal work and anxiousness from someone who God gave his life for. So I texted him back. Little did he know it wasn't out of love. <laughs> Which is a whole other sermon. Don't do that. But I was just fired up. And I'm like, his grace is sufficient for you. Let that be your fuel today. Let it be your strength when you feel weak in this interview. And remember God's mercy to you when you feel like complaining or proving yourself. God has already prepared the people you're going to meet with. He's already done the work. Your job is to be God's masterpiece. Maybe, maybe I should have just texted him Ephesians 2.8. Hey, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us a long time ago. You know what's striking me all of a sudden? There are people in this room that say, yeah, but you don't know what I did. This is why grace is so incredibly freeing as well. No, he does. And he is still offering his unconditional love. Well, you don't, you don't know. I'm still feeling like I was at this party last night, and huh? God knows. And you don't have to sit here tense. God loves you. It's unconditional love for you. His grace is sufficient for you. Let it be your fuel today. Let it lift your head again to the cross. Let it be your strength in God's weakness and remember God's mercy to you when you feel like complaining or proving. Life is a gift from God, and we know that this life is hard. There is a lot of ugliness in this world. There's violence, there's hatred, there's unfaithfulness, there's being betrayed, there's depression. There's long job interviews. But if you count yourself as one of God's people, he calls you his masterpiece. You're his masterpiece. Yeah, but I got, you're his masterpiece. And God's masterpiece will bring beauty and kindness and plant seeds of grace in this world. The seeds may take a long time to grow. I, I mean that. I mean literally think about planting seeds of a flower or a tree or whatever it takes a long time to grow but eventually it'll be a forest of beauty with living water running through it you may not always see it but it's going to be there because grace will never come back void your christian life the abundant life should always be fueled by grace paul puts it this way in second corinthians 12 he said Okay, Paul, I know you've got this thorn in the flesh. I know you don't do the things that you want to do for God. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's what Paul said, the man who said, I don't do what God wants me to do. 
That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. The Christian life, the abundant life, that focus gets fueled by grace. Dallas Willard says that people of faith that understand that, Christians should burn grace like a 747 burns fuel. Because we know. And if we burn grace like a 747 burns fuel, we can't help but give this grace away to others. Do you know how much hope it gives to people who feel like they deserve your condemnation, but you give them grace? Hope to those who feel they're not cool enough or smart enough or even maybe a good enough parent. Hope when we say, hey, I know, I'm going to walk with you in this, but God loves you unconditionally. Never forget. You know, sometimes we wake up <sighs> and we groan about our day ahead. But my friend who has cancer says it's a good life. And sometimes he's been known to say, I'm living the dream. Now, that doesn't mean that life is easy for him. It means he is living the grace-filled life. He is relying on God's power for the things he can't do on his own power. He is relying on God's unconditional love. And you know what my friend is? He's a masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to bring beauty into my world, into our world. And this is what he's calling you. He is one of the people that God points to as an example of his incredible grace, and I hope that God can point to me in that way too. So when you leave here today and you go out to lunch, it's a pretty day, and you go home on your slow tractor and you try to cut the lawn. <laughs> if you have to take the kids to a baseball game or even do that email that needs to be done tomorrow, remember, you're living the grace-filled life. And when something feels beyond your control, just say, oh, Father, your grace is, a, is sufficient for me. Your grace is sufficient for me. His power is resting on you. Hey, so church, keep burning. Keep burning the fuel of grace like a 747 burns fuel. Let's pray. Father, meet us in our weariness. Meet us in our hopes. And Lord, we pray that um, we might rest and live the abundant life you've called us to because you are calling us already a masterpiece. So Lord, give us the strength to once again confess our shortcomings and sins and then to run fields of green and by living water that will sustain us on our hardest days. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing one more song of worship together.